You know, I've been around for a while. I've met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you'd think that there wasn't much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer and others just defy logic. Have aliens infiltrated the human race? In Mexico, a farmer finds a mysterious and terrifying creature that looks like nothing on Earth. You know, I have invested thousands of dollars just trying to know what this creature is. Did pilots from another world crash land in Mexico? In Arizona, a woman claims to have been fathered by an ET in a top secret government experiment. There are extraterrestrials walking amongst us. Can human and extraterrestrial DNA mix together? And in Nevada, a US serviceman befriends a colony of aliens living secretly on an Air Force base. They wouldn't hesitate for a second to kill a human. Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. Do you believe in aliens? That's a question I'm asked quite a lot. And my answer is, I try to keep an open mind. I mean, who's to say? water who is living in the far corners of the galaxy. But think about it. So much we don't know about our own planet. Could aliens already be here living among us? Could they be our friends or even our neighbors? I knew there was something strange about those people. You're only supposed to mow the lawn in the afternoons. They're impossible to live with. May 26, 2007. In Metepec, near Mexico City, a farm worker is going about his duties in the barn. Suddenly, he hears a disturbing sound. It's coming from one of the traps he has set to catch rats. They never heard something like that. They couldn't exactly say this was the sound that we heard in another animal. He discovers to his horror that instead of a rat, the trap holds a tiny, human-like being. Jaime Mousa is Mexico's foremost UFO investigator. This creature is something that you have never seen before. The eyes are gray and amazing. The skin is like covered with oil. You can see some hair. You can see the feet. The feet are like human. The hands are like human. The head is like a baby head. The farm worker shows his colleagues what he's found. They don't know what to make of it. I can just imagine the surprise when they were seeing this creature moving and trying to escape. They were very afraid. Their boss is a wealthy local businessman named Mario Moreno Lopez. When Mario Morello Lopez saw the creature for the first time, he just said, what the hell is that? I never seen something like that. What is that? And nobody could answer to that question. Lopez is fascinated by the creature. Lo que estamos analizando tiene una rapidez increíble y tiene una inteligencia increíble, ¿no? But they can't figure out what to do with it. And the beast is shrieking in agony. The owner, Mario Lopez, probably, because he never told me that, but probably, he said, drown it or kill it, get rid of it. They come up with a gruesome solution. They'll kill the creature by immersing it in a toxic chemical bath. These are terrible chemicals, chemicals that are used to cure leather. You put in your hand, in your skin, and burns you. But then something inexplicable happens. The animal refuses to die. 
the creatures survive inside these chemicals. Could any, anything on Earth survive something like that? Finally, the beast is lifeless. Mario Lopez now has in his hands a dead creature. He doesn't know what it is. He knows it's not something normal. Lopez brings the creature to Masan, believing only he can solve the mystery. When I saw the creature for the first time, I was very skeptical. I didn't know if this was a joke. They were trying to confuse me or to discredit me. But Malsan is fascinated and decides to undertake an investigation. He subjects the creature to a battery of tests. We have tested this DNA of this creature around the world. And when the results come back, Masan is stunned. The animal is genetically distinct from any species known to man. We found in the DNA of this creature that is even closer than the chimpanzees to human beings. It's almost human. Mausan also believes the creature could have other, even more bizarre origins. We don't know how to test for alien DNA, but I'm very sure that the DNA of the aliens is very similar to the DNA of humans because the DNA is universal. But while Masan is trying to decipher the test results, his investigation takes a macabre twist. Mario Lopez, the owner of the ranch where the creature was caught, is found dead, burned to death in his own car. Mario Lopez brought the creature to me at the end of June 2007. Just four weeks later, he was murdered. Lopez's unexplained death raises a chilling new possibility. It is somehow connected with the death of the creature from Metapec. A person brings something so strange, and then he's murdered. What is going on? Today, Masan is still trying to solve the mystery. This is the only creature of its kind around the world. There is no more. We have this chance, and we have to solve this mystery to know if we are really alone in the universe. Wow, what a compelling and somewhat disturbing story. Mexican workers find a creature that resembles something like a deformed human baby or some kind of alien. They try and kill it, and then it somehow takes revenge on an innocent man by murdering him. Could a little guy like this do something like that? Is this proof that aliens exist and are here on Earth? I mean, this is Mexico we're talking about. All kinds of crazy things happen there. Of course, there could be a perfectly innocent explanation. Is this proof enough? Logan Hawks is the author of Close Encounters of the Old West. He believes the Metapec creature is just the latest in a long line of alien visitors that left their mark on that region. If you look back into the myth and mythology of the people that lived in this neck of the woods, the Metapec creature very much looks like a little person described in some of these legends. Hawks has an intriguing theory to explain the creature's origin. I believe this extraterrestrial creature was a pilot of a craft that flew through the zone of silence. It affected his guidance system, his ability to control the ship. He crashed on a farm where he was discovered by a Mexican farmer. The zone of silence, according to Hawks, is a mysterious region of northern Mexico where aircraft inexplicably crash and UFO sightings are common. This is an area that could be compared to the Bermuda Triangle or the Devil's Triangle. The region gets its name from a strange magnetic irregularity that affects everything that passes through it. Technology within the zone of silence doesn't work the way that it should, not the way that it does in other places. For example, microwaves, electronic equipment, seems to uh, have a lot of interference. For instance, a handheld compass 
We cannot read magnetic north. The needle will just spin and spin and spin. The zone of silence exploded into headlines in 1970 when it caused a sophisticated U.S. Athena missile to crash. The guidance system went very strange, and it landed in the heart of the zone of silence. It was carrying a nuclear payload, so there was a great deal of controversy over an American missile crashing on foreign soil. There was an extraction that happened, and it's quite an interesting subject. No one knows why the zone of silence causes electronics to go haywire, but Hawks believes the explanation is more supernatural than scientific. There's something that you feel from the earth, from the ground, from the rocks, from the mountains. You can't put your finger on it. It's like someone's in the room watching you. Was the Metapec creature a member of an advanced alien race? Could the zone of silence have caused its spaceship to crash? Or could there be an even stranger explanation? I'm convinced that this creature is actually something from another dimension. A Mexican farm worker finds a tiny creature unlike anything known to science. DNA tests are unable to identify it. Is it an extraterrestrial? For paranormal expert Timothy Beckley, the Metapec creature raises more questions than answers. If it had any great intelligence and was coming from afar, why would it get trapped in some sort of animal trap? Uh, and also, where's its craft? And where's its breathing apparatus? So if the Metapec creature wasn't a pint-sized alien pilot, what was it? I believe that there is a invisible race of beings that coexist right alongside of us on this planet. I have had three UFO sightings, so I know that these things are real. They are not hoaxes, they are not hallucinations, but I do not believe that most of the objects that have been seen are from outer space. I think they are more closely akin to our own reality. Perhaps they come from another dimension. Perhaps they come from somewhere beneath the, uh, the Earth. But the sightings are real, and people are reporting legitimate, far-out things. I'm convinced that this creature, this so-called alien baby, is what is known as a, uh, a jinn, a invisible, supernatural being that exists on a parallel dimension. The jinn, or genie, as it is also known, is a being first described in the Muslim holy book, the Quran. They're said to appear out of nowhere to create mischief. And of course, we do know about the, uh, the genie and the lamp that have the ability to change shape. Sometimes they are seen as small beasts. Even more intriguing, Beckley claims to have hard evidence of their existence. I have compared it to photographs that people have taken of these, uh, these jinn, and they look remarkably similar. Beckley says further proof can be found in the death of Mario Lopez, the rancher who found the creature. They are evil, sinister creatures. If you kill or injure a jinn, you can expect some form of repercussion. The farmer who was responsible for the death of this creature felt the heavy hand of the jinn. Could this be an interdimensional case of mistaken identity? Or is the truth just as weird, but closer to home? Taxidermist Robert Marbury is fascinated with the Metapec creature. But he doesn't think it's alien or a trans-dimensional being. He believes it's a hoax. I think the Metapec creature is a skinned spider monkey. And how can he be so sure? Marbury is director of the Minneapolis Association of Rogue Taxidermists. It's a group that creates artwork out of animal leftovers. I'll tell you about the, the work that our members make. Some of them make cryptozoological animals, animals that may or may not exist, uh, chubacabras, uh, Fiji mermaids, Capricorns. Is the Metapec creature a piece of creative taxidermy glued together in somebody's garage? To find out, Marbury is going to demonstrate how easy it is to create one. So the proposal is how do you create a Metapec creature? I'm on the east coast of the U.S. I don't have access to monkeys. Um, I have access, however, to squirrels. And, and this particular piece is a roadkill. So what I've done is I've taken this and I've skinned it. I have a taxidermy friend that calls it taking off the pajamas. Barbary then covers the carcass in salt to dry it out. Salt's the best mummifier. It takes all the, the liquids out of the tissue. The next step a drastic makeover to take it from everyday rodent 
to Cosmic Commuter. He's going to take sort of traditional clippers and, and really remove the head and replace it with this monkey skull, which would allow it to be a little bit more like the Metapet creature. Marbury then uses sandpaper to shape the skull and teeth. But you can, you can see very quickly how you can make it look more and more like a human's mouth. And at this point, we, we kind of feel like we've seen this guy somewhere before. In just a few simple steps, Robert Marbury has crafted a skeleton that looks just like the Metapet creature. But could such a thing fool the experts? According to Marbury, it's happened before. There's a chupacabra that was found in Texas. And it made a lot of news cycles. And I sent that picture to a friend of mine who makes beautiful rogue tags during me. And her response was, yeah, it's pretty nice, isn't it? And I realized she had actually made it. But if these fakes can be so easily spotted, how has the Metabek creature fooled so many people for so long? Humans are hardwired to make sense of random patterns. We see something which we don't see on a daily basis, and your mind kind of rallies for an answer, and then the suggestion, oh, this is an alien. I uh, think that's a little arrogant on our part to, to envision aliens as a, you know, a version of me, but with a, a, a big head. I think when you get down to Akram's razor and the simplest explanation is often the correct one. This, to me, is a spider monkey. Was the Metapec beast created through taxidermy? Is it a supernatural djinn from another dimension? Or is it an alien pilot that crash-landed in northern Mexico? Weird. Or what? In Arizona, a woman discovers she's the product of a sinister experiment, breeding humans with aliens. They created me in the Petri dish. We've seen many strange and amazing things on this show. But what if I told you that you're about to see something that's not only the most strange and amazing thing ever, but that we're about to make history? You see, millions of people have claimed they've seen UFOs or met an alien, but not one of them has any evidence, no living proof. Well, today we're about to change that once and for all because today is the day you are going to meet an alien. Not on some hazy video or in a lab. No, 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 no. Face to face in person, really. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Cynthia. March 24th, 1972, Omaha, Nebraska. Cynthia Crawford has just experienced the most joyful event of her life, the birth of her son. But the pregnancy has been difficult and the doctors have made a strange discovery. She has an exceptionally rare and mysterious blood type. The thing was, there was only two other people in the world that had the same antigen as was found in my blood. It's not the first time she's been told she has bizarre physical abnormalities. Her body is just different and no one can tell her why. Her pupils don't dilate normally. Her skin is strangely thick. Her bones are porous. My twin sister had muscular dystrophy, and when they went to see if they could do a transplant, we were incompatible. But it's not only Cynthia's body that's extraordinary. It's also her mind. Even as a toddler, I realized how different I was because um, I was always able to do things that my sisters couldn't do. I remember drawing with crayons and so forth, and all of a sudden, I wanted a crayon, and I literally moved it with my mind to me. I also was able to hear thoughts, and they couldn't hear thoughts. For years, Cynthia searches in vain for an explanation. Then one day, her father, a retired CIA agent, reveals the brutal truth. He tells her she was part of a top secret government program with a dark mission. My father told me that our government were working with the German scientists that were brought over after World War II. 
But as Cynthia pours over secret government documents, she learns something even more mind-boggling. She was created in a laboratory, a product of her father's covert breeding program. He had agreed to participate in an experiment in which they were making hybrid babies. This alarming experiment aimed to mix genetic material from extraterrestrials with human DNA. I was told I'm part human and part extraterrestrial. The way they created me in the Petri dish was they used uh, alien DNA that the German scientists brought over with them and the rest from my father and my mother and mixed it all together in the Petri dish and then in, inserted it in my mother's womb. And that's how I came to be. I've been told that I'm 34% human 28% Zeta and 38% Anunnaki. And I'm not alone. And I know that because I've had numerous phone calls and emails from people that know that they've come from other planets. I've even met them. Crawford is stunned by her father's confession. My first reaction was anger. I was very angry to think that, that this would have been done to me. Because of all the abilities, the things that I was able to do, my whole life I was told I was a creep or a freak. When the story sinks in, it unlocks a secret past that's somehow remained dormant in the young woman's mind. Her entire life has been haunted by nightmares of alien encounters and weird lab experiments. Now she thinks she knows why. They're real memories from her childhood. That answered all these questions about why I was having visits from beings and why I'd been taken up in ships all my life. My very first memory of an encounter with an extraterrestrial, I remember standing up in my baby bed and holding on uh, to the bars. And I remember talking to a being, giggling and laughing but Cynthia isn't traumatized. Instead, she embraces her new identity and tries to find out more. She learns the secret government program is not only larger than anyone could possibly imagine, but she's not the only one it created. There are extraterrestrials walking amongst us. We're talking about probably hundreds of thousands on this planet of extraterrestrials and hybrids. Are Cynthia Crawford's claims far-fetched nonsense? Or could the unthinkable be true? Can humans and aliens combine? How many hybrids are out there? And what exactly is their purpose? Yeah. Grandkids. Don't you just love them, huh? Wow, this is, this is a remarkable story. And you know, the more I look around, the more I'm convinced that aliens indeed could live among us. And there's just one problem I don't understand. Why? I mean, if you were an alien, why would you choose to live among a species like us? Wouldn't you go for something a little more advanced, like Amoebas? Hypnotherapist Yvonne Smith has worked with Cynthia Crawford for years. I find her to be very credible and a very honest person. Yvonne doesn't think Cynthia is the product of a secret government program. She says it's the aliens themselves who are responsible. Cynthia fits the pattern of someone who has been abducted by alien beings. She has had strange pregnancies. She has had uh, objects implanted in her body. But what about Cynthia's memories of medical experiments in secret laboratories? They're exactly what happens, says Smith, in a real alien abduction. When someone has an abduction experience, always what, what it involves is 
oba being taken from the women, sperm being taken from the men. It's not pleasant. It, it's not sexual. It's very clinical. These alien beings have an agenda, and they're carrying out that agenda. Now, ultimately, what's going to happen with these hybrids is the million-dollar question. We don't know. I just know, and I will go out on a limb now, after 20 years of research, that these hybrids do exist. They're here. Um, I, I, it's something that I never thought I would be saying years ago. But why would extraterrestrial beings want to create human hybrids? It's obvious that the aliens need something from us. Otherwise, they would have terminated us a long time ago. This is a silent invasion. Uh, we don't know what the ultimate purpose is. Did extraterrestrials abduct Cynthia and perform experiments on her? And if that's true, how did her father know so much about it? Melinda Leslie has been a UFO researcher for over two decades. She theorizes that Cynthia was kidnapped by both aliens and humans as the victim of another top secret government program known as MyLab. MyLab is an acronym meaning military abduction, M-I-L for military and A-B for abduction. And it refers to alien abductees who then are targeted by covert black ops human military and intelligence community agencies. Apparently the program targets anyone suspected of having contact with beings from other planets. First you get abducted by aliens, and then you get abducted, re-abducted by the government. My lab abductions is much more common than we realize, at least in alien abduction accounts, that people who've had the alien abduction experience, and most major abduction researchers in the world agree that that number is, is probably upwards of 10, 15% of the world's population. And then it seems that 10 or 20% of those people have then had also the MyLab experience. So once someone has had alien abduction, for it to escalate into that, point, into that place where there is a covert ops interest in them seems to be very common. She says Crawford's story bears all the signs of a classic MyLab abduction. These are all alien abductees. They've had harassment, surveillance, they've been re-abducted, they've been taken to underground bases, they've had medical procedures done on them and have been interrogated about alien technology. But why would the government do such a thing? They're interested in the abductee's psi abilities, uh, meaning psychic. Does the abductee perform psychic abilities? Do they do telepathy, psychokinesis? Can they move matter with their mind? They're interested in abductee's genetics. Have they been genetically enhanced? Have they been genetically altered or affected by the ETs? Could it be the CIA is using the program to prepare for an alien invasion of Earth? Covert intelligence and military agencies are trying in every way they can to get all the information they can about the ETs, about their motives and agendas. Leslie believes if the MyLab program were ever made public, it would destroy the government. It's immoral, unconstitutional, illegal, to say the least. These are humans mistreating humans. Is Cynthia Crawford the victim of a sinister covert intelligence program? Is she the product of an alien program to create human hybrids? Or could there be another explanation? We share 50% of our genes with bananas, for crying out loud. A woman believes she's an alien-human hybrid produced in the secret government lab. Did extraterrestrials perform experiments on her? Is she the victim of a CIA covert mission? Physical anthropologist Dr. Eugenie Scott says an alien-human combination is impossible. Why would we assume that there's any similarity in the genes of an alien and the genes of a human? And if you don't have the same genes, you can't produce offspring. You can't produce that hybrid. Dr. Scott thinks for hybrids to exist, aliens would have to possess DNA, the molecule that encodes the genetic blueprint for every living thing on Earth. What's the probability that the DNA of an alien would in any way, shape, or form line up with our DNA? The probability is, is zero. 
DNA is a chain-like molecule that's found in every cell. And among other functions, it has to do with passing on the hereditary information from generation to generation. So if you're a mosquito or a single-celled organism, a slime mold or a human being, you've got DNA. And when mosquitoes or humans reproduce, um, a strand of DNA from a male and a strand of DNA from a female link up and in that fertilized egg allow for the cells to divide and to differentiate in a new mosquito or a new human being to be born. But if you take a strand of human DNA and a strand of mosquito DNA, they're not going to link up. So you're not going to get a mosquito-human hybrid or, you know, too bad for the movie The Fly, but um, human DNA just doesn't link up with the DNA of any other creature on this planet. Dr. Scott also claims only species evolved from a recent common ancestor can successfully form hybrids. So closely related species of baboons can form hybrids. Tigers and lions can form hybrids because they haven't been separated all that long. Uh, horses and donkeys can form hybrids because they haven't been separated all that long. This science begs a question. If different species can successfully hybridize, what about humans? Have we ever done it? Guess what? We have. Probably the closest relative to humans is the extinct Neanderthals. And there's some very interesting evidence that suggests that humans and Neanderthals hybridized. But could a hybrid have been engineered in the secret Cold War lab, the way Cynthia Crawford claims? If you believe Dr. Scott, it's been tried before with our closest living relative. Russian scientists back in the 30s and 40s uh, tried unsuccessfully to make a hybrid between a human and a chimpanzee. Who knows whether such a thing could be done today? It's probably very unlikely. But what about Cynthia's memories? There have been a lot of, of studies on people who have claimed to have had encounters with aliens. The bottom line is there's never any actual evidence. Dr. Scott thinks Cynthia's claims require extraordinary proof. If I told you that I had a colony of invisible fairies under my bed, you'd say, a genie, where's your evidence for that? And I'd say, well, look at the dust. Invisible fairies cause dust. You would probably say, but dust can come from another cause. Maybe you don't clean your house enough. The doctor feels there's only one sure way to determine if Cynthia's claims are true. I think that if anybody did a DNA test on her, she would be found to have 100% human DNA. Is Cynthia Crawford an alien hybrid? We decided to find out. For the first time, Cynthia has agreed to undergo a DNA analysis. Hi there, how are you? Hi, fine. I'm just gonna do a quick swab on you. Well, I guess this is it for uh, Cynthia Crawford. I mean, uh, DNA tests don't lie, right? It's incredible, isn't it? I, I mean, just a tiny fragment of organic matter, they can tell everything about what you're made of. Oh my goodness, I'm made of pepperoni. In a few days, the results are back. Cynthia, I'm Dr. Baird. I have the results of your DNA test. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Dr. Baer's test looked for DNA inherited from both of Cynthia's parents. Did he find it? We do DNA testing, we do it all the time. It was a little bit interesting to see whether we could pick up anything that would be different. The test comes back conclusive. So the bottom line, Cynthia, Looks like you are human based on the results that are here. Cynthia has DNA from a normal human mother and father. But how? Did her father lie? I'm very saddened by it because I wanted to be able to have some kind of proof. But in this remarkable story, there's still one more twist. Even though we could not pick up any alien DNA in your profile, doesn't mean that it's not there. It means that we don't have the systems that are available to pick it up. For Cynthia, it's good news. It means there's a chance her wild claims could yet be true. They have absolutely no way of determining alien DNA. There are no tests for alien DNA because they've never had aliens that they've been able to get DNA swabs from. Could Cynthia have alien DNA after all? Is she the victim of a sinister alien abduction? Or was she the target 
of a top secret intelligence gathering operation. Whatever the truth, this story is 100% weird. Or what? A U.S. serviceman befriends an alien colony on a secret Air Force base. They wouldn't hesitate for a second to kill a human. You know, if aliens are living here on Earth, they're, they're doing a good job of hiding themselves. Some take on the appearance of humans, others look like animals, but there's one place on Earth that aliens can relax and be themselves. Somewhere where being totally strange and weird isn't strange. March 1965, at the height of the Cold War and the start of the conflict in Vietnam, the U.S. government is busy building the most powerful air force in history. One of its new recruits is 20-year-old Charles Hall. Charles James Hall, Airman Second Class, U.S. Air Force. Hall is assigned to Nellis Air Force Base, a vast and secret testing range in the Nevada desert located near the infamous Area 51. Hall's job is to observe weather conditions in isolated areas. I was walking from the weather station back to my barracks at about 12.15 at night. There were three of them out by the garbage container. One of them was following me. I thought that I was sleepwalking or dreaming. As the days go on, the sightings continue. Hall wonders if he's losing his mind. For the first six months, I was in terror. And even when they were standing in front of me, I thought I was hallucinating. I'm out there alone, and I don't have any frame of reference. The fear of the unknown is far worse than being shot at or anything else. As the encounters continue, Hall begins to accept a bizarre possibility. They're not hallucinations. They're extraterrestrials. He even gives them a nickname, the Tall Whites. The reason I call them the Tall Whites is because um, their skin is as white as a piece of paper. But why are they there? The young airman soon discovers it's no accident. Not only are his Air Force superiors aware of the aliens' presence, they're hosting them in a secret underground complex, protected and hidden from outside view. It was a very large base because it was all tunneled into the mountain. In return, they hope the visitors will share the secrets of their advanced technology. I estimate that there were probably 200 tall whites living on the base. Deciding to investigate further, Hall uncovers something disturbing. The tall whites aren't quite as friendly as they seem. Official records reveal many of his predecessors on duty at the weather station mysteriously lost their minds or were killed by the aliens. 41 airmen were sent out there before me. Many of them became so afraid of the desert and the tall whites that they wouldn't go out and take the weather report at all. Others were attacked, some were burned. But why would they attack? There's a simple answer. The tall whites are accompanied by their children and the mothers are ruthlessly protective. The tall white mother wouldn't hesitate for a second to kill a human. Hall finds a way to earn their trust. He rescues the child of an alien he calls the teacher. I was out at range one one day and I saw the teacher's daughter, the, the, whose name was the little butterfly, uh, trapped out in the sagebrush and I went out and broke down the sagebrush and rescued her. As a result, Hall is given extraordinary access to the creatures, allowing him to study them up close for the next two years. What he learns defies belief. The young adults are about the same height that I am, 5'10", 
but they're very frail. Their nervous system runs two and a half or three times faster than ours, and so when you're dealing with them, they can move suddenly or do very unexpected things way faster than a human can. The tall whites had vehicles that they used the way we use cars to travel around the Earth and between the Earth and the Moon and the inner solar system. I'm not certain where they come from. I, I believe they come here from the direction of the star Arcturus, which lays out there at 36 light years, but that is not their home planet. My guess is that their home planet is a star that is roughly 105 light years away, and that Arcturus is where they have a base. I believe they've been here for a very long time. I note that the ancient Greeks, the legends of ancient Greece that date from at least 975 BC, talk about a group of tall white gods that came here from the star Arcturus. And the men of ancient Greece said that when, you were, when they were camping on the slopes of Mount Olympus in the warm summer nights, these gods would come and stand just out of range of the firelight, of the campfire light, and watch everything they were doing. If that seems implausible, Hall's next claim borders on preposterous. But what if it's true? They get bored sitting out on the base at Indian Springs and they like to come into Las Vegas and see the shows and gamble and enjoy themselves. The tall whites were very good gamblers because their eyesight was better than those of humans. So they could look at the back of a card in the blackjack deck and always tell what the next card was. Paul finished his military service in 1968 and never saw the tall whites again. He believes they're still living at Indian Springs. It would surprise me if they weren't because they had been in that, air, in that mountain, in that valley, for at least 200 years. Could this be definitive proof that aliens are on Earth? Has the U.S. government been harboring extraterrestrials? Or is Hall's story simply the ravings of an eccentric? Veteran UFO reporter Paula Harris spent months investigating Hall's story. I truly believe the credibility of this man, and I believe this story. It's truly an amazing story. Harris obtained Hall's old Air Force psychological tests to try to determine if he might have been mentally unbalanced. She made a startling discovery. Hall passed with flying colors. It was a test on logic. So Charles Hall is very controlled, and he's very logical, and he's very credible as a uh, witness. Harris also learned that after his military service, Hall completed two master's degrees and worked as a nuclear physicist before going public with his stories of tall whites. Could someone that educated simply be making it up? She thinks Hall's account is simply too thorough and meticulous to have been invented. Charles goes into detail about how these people live, about their lifestyle. I can tell when someone is telling the truth, and I believe Charles Hall's story. He tells it very clearly, concisely, and he also remembers details. The man is incredible with details. He, he lived this, he knows about this case, and he, it, it's been part of his, his life. Could Charles Hall's fantastical claims be true? Are aliens using Earth as a second home? Or is there another answer? I've had lots of schizophrenia patients talk about how they lived with aliens. A man claims to have lived with a colony of aliens on a U.S. Air Force base. Does his military background make his story credible? Psychotherapist Kimberly Moffat doesn't think so. She's in shock by Hall's stories of living with aliens. She's heard them before, from her own patients. I've had lots of schizophrenia patients talk about how they lived with aliens, and in the mental health field, this is very common. Moffat feels such visions could be a symptom of a rare condition known as grandiose delusion disorder. Grandiose delusional disorder is the type of delusion that happens when people think that they're kind of the strongest, fastest, and most intelligent person alive. 
in some cases, the, the delusions actually have like a supernatural or religious or science fiction type quality. According to Moffat, one symptom of GDD is the subject has no idea they're delusional and are all the more believable because of it. The way that I would explain the consistency of Charles Hall's story is that he really does remember this as if it were facts happening. So in any person that's experiencing a, a hallucination or delusion, it is very real to them. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, what he experienced, it may not be real to any of us, but in his own mind could have been very real and very detail oriented, almost as if it were a dream. So you and I have dreams every night and we might wake up and feel a certain way and remember vividly what happened. And this is the same way that somebody with a mental health disorder might remember a hallucination. With someone with this type of delusional disorder, it isn't a malicious act. He really does feel like this happened to him and he wants to tell his story. But if these memories are delusional, what caused it? Moffat feels it was the very thing that brought him to Indian Springs in the first place, military service. We know that he did fight in Vietnam and um, a lot of times when war survivors come back, they're incredibly traumatized. Sometimes that can be something that lasts for the rest of their life and can even push them into having other mental health issues. With something like schizophrenia, there is a genetic component. That part has been proven. Um, so if you do have a family member or somebody um, who's been in your, in your ancestry that has schizophrenia, then there's a chance that you could have it too. But people also, it's kind of like a light switch going on and off. And a lot of times we find that schizophrenia sufferers have their first experience when they're under an extreme amount of stress. So it could be fighting in a war, going through a traumatic experience, or even you know being in music school or writing exams in law school, that type of thing. When people are really, really stressed to the max, we find that that's when they have their first episodes. So that is definitely something that could trigger the onset of a, of a delusional disorder. Could psychological trauma be the root of Charles Hall's memories? Did military service make him retreat into a fantasy world? Do tall whites exist only in his mind? Conspiracy expert Patrick White thinks so, but not for the reason you might think. He thinks Charles Hall was the victim of a secret government mind control program known as Project MKUltra. It attempted to discover if LSD and other drugs could be used as weapons. The CIA and the government were trying to find a virtual truth serum. They were performing all kinds of weird and bizarre uh, experiments on these individuals to basically see how they could get them to confess military secrets. They were basically recruiting unwitting patients. Uh, individuals were going into hospitals for anxiety, uh, depression disorders, and for months they were just experimented on. Un unknowingly and unwittingly. The victims of the MK Ultra project were generally subjected to various forms of torture and abuse. They were trying to break down the will of the individual and remove the personality completely so that they can program them in whichever way they saw fit. So people were administered amphetamines where they would be completely jacked up for periods of time and then they would be administered barbiturates through an IV where they would be completely brought down. Uh, people were administered LSD and were forced to listen to repetitive uh, audio loops over hours at a time. People were put into drug-induced comas. Basically anything that could be done to break the will of an individual it was tried. Did MK Ultra implant false stories into Hall's brain? They could have programmed him to think he was a platypus, and he would have believed it. They could have totally programmed him to think, wow, I've interacted, worked, lived, and mingled with alien beings. Was Charles Hall the victim of secret government mind control experiments? Is he suffering from a delusional psychological disorder? Or did he really live among aliens at a US Air Force base? Weird. Or what? So there we have it. 
Stories of real-life ETs who may be our friends and neighbors. In Mexico, a strange and unidentifiable creature is found by a rancher. Could it be a visitor from another world? In Phoenix, a woman claims to be a human-alien hybrid. Does she represent a new transplanetary species? And in Nevada, a young serviceman discovers extraterrestrials living on a remote Air Force base. Is the U.S. government covering up its contacts with an alien civilization? Are these stories evidence that we share our world with beings from outer space? Can we dismiss those who claim these things are true? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? <laughs>